Welcome back to the workshop. Today we'll be doing a crash course on tillering and answering all your lingering questions about tiller shapes and the tillering process. When should you use circular or elliptical tiller? Why do bows call for different tiller shapes? How do you tiller around knots and character? I'll also be covering plenty of tips, tricks, and hacks that will help guide you to full draw. Chapter 1. Tillering Basics The goal when you tiller is to monitor and minimize set, to reach the target draw length, and to reach the target draw weight. Tillering is all about distributing the bend throughout the limbs, so that no one part of the bow is overworked. In other words, we want to push the material as hard as we can, but not so far that it takes on much of a permanent bend. The tillering cycle has three main steps to it. First, remove wood from the stiff areas of the limb. Leave alone any areas that are bending more, and only carve those stiff spots. Second, exercise the bow to register the changes to the tiller, always pulling at the target draw weight. That is unless you see one of the issues we'll talk about later. Third, Repeat the first and second steps until the target draw length is reached. If you consistently pulled at the target draw weight, you should be pretty close to the goal. I like to think of tiller as the way you distribute the bend throughout the limb. The ideal tiller shape for your bow depends on its profiles and geometry. Some bows call for an even, circular bend, while others call for a tightening of the bending radius towards the outer limb, forming an elliptical tiller shape. Tillering goes hand in hand with bow design. In order to nail the tiller, we also have to start off with a design that can handle the tiller we want. If you've been having trouble tillering, or your bows are taking a lot of set, then you should try making your designs longer or wider, or with less reflex. Chapter two, tiller shapes. There are two main considerations when it comes to tiller shapes, whether the handle is stiff or bending, and whether the tiller shape is more circular or more elliptical. When the handle bends, we say that the bow has a full compass tiller. When you have a stiff handle, the limbs are somewhat independent and will each follow their own separate curve. For a bending handle bow, the entire bow will conform to one single curve. The main characteristic of circular tiller is a constant bending radius from inner limb to outer limb. On the other hand, with elliptical tiller, the bending radius tightens as you go from the inner limb to the outer limb. Confusingly, many bowyers refer to full compass tiller and circular tiller interchangeably, but it is worth distinguishing the two. A full compass bow can have either a circular or elliptical tiller, or anything in between. In general, bows with a thickness taper call for a more elliptical than circular tiller, for reasons we'll get into soon. Chapter 3, the profiles of the bow and how they influence the tiller shape. The front profile, side profile, and full draw shape have a dynamic relationship, and they all influence each other, from the early design stage all the way to full draw. Not every bow calls for the same tiller shape. In order to know what tiller shape a bow ought to have, we need to look at its profiles. Let's look at some examples. I'll be using a pyramid bow to represent designs with more width taper and a parallel limb bow to represent designs with less width taper. More width taper leads to less thickness taper, which leads to a more circular tiller. On the other hand, less width taper leads to more thickness taper, which leads to a more elliptical tiller. With a pyramid bow, the inner limbs will bend more than a parallel limb bow's inner limbs. Since the inner limbs of a pyramid bow are so wide, they can be thinner, allowing them to bend to a tighter radius. With the parallel limb bow, the inner limbs aren't as wide, so they have to be thicker. Since the inner limbs are thicker, they won't be able to bend to as tight of a radius without taking set. As a result, parallel limb bows bend less from the inner limbs and more from the outer limbs, compared to the pyramid bow. On the other hand, since the outer limbs of the parallel limb bow are wider than the pyramid, once again, they can be thinner, allowing those outer limbs to bend to a tighter radius. Chapter four, dealing with character bows and knots. 
So far we've only talked about tiller shapes for bows with perfect smooth profiles, and staves that are not and wiggle free. In reality those staves were a rare luxury, and most will have defects like knots, bends, and wiggles. If your bow has character, you can't force it to conform to the same shape as a perfect stave. The full draw shape should reflect the ups and downs in the side profile. Once again, the goal is to smoothly distribute the bending, so that the strain doesn't concentrate on any one area. In order to do this, we have to follow the thickness taper, all the way through the limb, even if there are ups and downs or knots. Later in the video I'll be showing you a little known tillering hack that will really help guide you through these difficult character bows. Just like the side profile, we need to follow the lay of the fibers when it comes to the front profile. If the fibers wiggle side to side, don't cut straight lines through them, and instead include the wiggles in the front profile of the bow. This is especially important when it comes to knots. The fibers and knots are perpendicular to the longitudinal fibers in your bow, which are doing all of the heavy work. In other words, the wood in the knot is dead weight, and it shouldn't be counted as part of the width in your front profile. Think of your bow limb like a river, and a knot like an island in the middle of the river. The water will flow around the sides of the islands, just like the fibers in your bow will naturally flow around knots. Make sure you follow that flow of fibers, because if you ignore them and simply cut straight lines, you may really weaken the bow. If possible, it can be helpful to pop out the knot, or carve it away, leaving a hole in the bow, or a dimple in the belly. This does not necessarily weaken the bow, as long as you have plenty of bending limb flowing around the sides of the knot. As long as the part of the bow flowing around the sides of the knot are sturdy and tillered well, they won't form a weak spot. Make sure you deal with knots before they're an issue. If you force the sides of the bow to be straight, and then later you try to deal with the knot, you won't have enough width to let the fibers flow around the knot. I try to deal with knots as early as I possibly can. I usually try to split and pry away all the knots as soon as possible. Then you can lay out your bow with whatever clean wood is left over. If you wait until tillering to remove knots, you risk massively weakening the bow in that spot, and not having enough wood left over around the sides. Dealing with knots is best done during the heavy part of construction, and not during tillering, when things are more delicate. So in summary, the key things to remember about character bows are number one, follow the lay of the fibers. Number two, respect the thickness taper despite any character and knots. And number three, let the drawn shape of the bow reflect the up and down wiggles of the side profile. At this point, we've covered when everything goes according to plan, but that doesn't always happen. Chapter 5, Tiller Issues. Here I'll be covering some of the most common tiller issues and how to correct them. Number 1, Hinges. If you remove too much wood from a localized spot on your bow, it will start to bend too much and form a hinge. To fix the tiller, remove wood everywhere else and avoid the hinged area. Number two, whip tiller. If your bow bends too much from the outer limb, we say that it's whip tillered. This can make the bow sweet and pleasant to shoot, but reduces the amount of energy your bow can store. Improve the issue by working on the mid and the inner limbs. Number three, too much bend from the inner limbs or fades. This is probably the most common tiller issue I see. You can think of this issue as not having enough thickness taper. If you imagine bending any pole or stick, it will mainly bend from the middle with stiff outer limbs. If you want the whole bow to bend, you have to taper the limbs enough. Another reason you might see too much inner limb bending is if you've forced a circular tiller on a bow that calls for a more elliptical shape. The goal in tillering is not quite to make the bend even, as is often misleadingly said. The goal is to distribute the bending so each part of the bow does its fair share of work. Depending on the profiles of the bow, you'll have to distribute that bending differently. For that reason, if you use a tillering gizmo, keep in mind that most bows don't call for a literal circular tiller, because most bows have a thickness taper. Since the tips are thinner than the inner limbs, they can bend to a tighter radius. If you force the whole bow to bend to the same radius, the inner limbs will bend too much, and the outer limbs won't be bending enough. Chapter 6. How to post a tiller check on a bow making forum. If you're having some trouble tillering, or you just need some help or a second opinion, you can post a tiller check on any bow making forum. Feel free to post as many tiller checks as you need, 
They're great for the community and very helpful for new members. Seriously, don't hold back if you need help. There are good bowyers on all the major forums who enjoy passing on the craft and helping you through issues they've been through before. If you want my help in particular, post on the Reddit forum r slash bowyer and I'll drop in when I can. If you do post a tiller check, just make sure to post all three of the key profiles of the bow. If you only post the drawn shape, we won't have enough context to know if that's the right shape or not. For example, something that might appear to be a hinge could just be part of the natural character of the stave. We need to see the front and the side profile to know what drawn shape your bow ought to have. If you want to show the tiller of the bow, you need all three pictures, otherwise we're just seeing a shape. Tiller isn't just a shape, it's the way you distribute the bend throughout the limbs. And we need to see the shape of the limbs in order to know how you should be distributing that bending. Chapter 7. How to Tiller. The Stages of the Tillering Process. Floor Tillering, Short String Tillering, and Long String Tillering. Most bowyers like to subdivide the tillering process into three stages, each getting you about a third of the way to full draw. As we move from the rough out into the tillering stages, the work will become more and more refined, and you'll be focusing on removing less wood with more accuracy. During the rough out, you'll be forming most of the shape of the bow, and then during the floor tiller, you'll be doing most of the heavy lifting in terms of forming the bend shape. As you move on to long and short string tillering, it will be harder to make big changes, but the methods used will give you more control to make refined adjustments. During the floor tillering stage, you'll mostly be pushing the bow against the ground, with roughly the force of your target draw weight. You can also bend the bow in your vise to see how the limbs move independently. When you floor tiller, watch how the bow bends, either by looking down or observing with a mirror or a camera. Keep carving wood from the stiff areas, while leaving the bending areas alone. Then go back and check the bend, and repeat. Once the tips are moving a few inches, then you can move on to long string tillering. During this stage, we'll be using a tillering string to pull the bow, but the bow hasn't been braced yet, and the string is loose. Make sure to shorten the long string to about the length of your bow. If there's too much slack in the string, then you won't get accurate draw weight readings, and you'll see distorted string tip angles. Most bowyers long string tiller on a tiller tree with a pulley, but if you don't have one, you can step on the bow and pull up on the string, or step on the string and pull up on the bow. Some bowyers like to brace the bow as soon as possible, but I prefer to be gentler on the wood and brace around 20 inches of draw on the long string. When you actually switch between stages is totally a personal preference. Once you have the bow braced, you're on the home stretch and will be short string tillering all the way to full draw. In a sense, this stage is just like the others. You're removing wood from the stiff areas and leaving the bending areas alone. The main difference is the magnitude of wood removal. During the short string tillering phase, you'll be taking off very small amounts of wood at a time and making much more refined adjustments. Many bowyers like to judge the bend of the bow based on the braced shape, but be careful if you do this with a character bow. If the limbs have a slightly different amount of reflex, the braced shape of the bow will look wonky. Don't worry about it as long as the fully drawn bow is balanced. The drawn shape is much more directly important than the braced shape. That said, if you have a very perfect stave, or are making a board or a laminate bow, then it can be very helpful to judge the tiller based on the braced shape. This just doesn't work well for every bow. Chapter 8. Tillering Tips, Tricks, and Hacks in this section, I'll be covering some quote-unquote tiller hacks that will help guide you along the way. These are all methods I can vouch for that are actually used by skilled bowyers. If you know any that I haven't covered, please let us know in the comments. The first and best known is the notorious tillering gizmo. I believe they were invented by Mr. Eric Krusen, and they have since become very popular. It's an incredibly simple device, just a block of wood with a pencil that sticks out the center. The pencil is threaded through a nut, so you can control how far it sticks out of the board by giving it a little twist. The further you make the pencil stick out, the tighter the bending radius that the gizmo will guide you towards. If you use the gizmo in a straightforward way, it will guide you towards an even bending radius, or in other words, a circular tiller. Keep in mind that, for most bows that call for an elliptical tiller, this will lead to too much inner limb bending. If you want to get an elliptical tiller with the gizmo, you have to adjust the length the pencil sticks out independently for the inner, mid, and outer limbs. The problem is that in order to know how much to adjust the gizmo, you have to already know in advance what the tiller shape should look like. And if you know, you probably don't need the gizmo's help. Anyway, if you've been having trouble making the bend nice and smooth, then a tillering gizmo will really help you out. Even when a circular tiller is the wrong shape, that's still way better than a tiller with a hinge.
The other main drawback of the gizmo is that they're very hard to use on character staves. They're much better for boards, perfect staves, and laminate bows. For the type of work that I do, I find that they don't really help. But you should give them a shot. It's a very helpful tool. There's a link in the description of the video to instructions on how to make one. Next, let's cover my friend Aaron G. Webster's No Gas Tillering Method. This method has a huge advantage, which is that it's perfectly suited to character staves loaded with bends and wiggles. If you're interested, I linked a detailed post about this in the video description. The gist of the method is that a straight edge is used to draw short straight lines along the side of the bow. When you brace the bow, you can hold the straight edge against these lines to see how much that portion is bending. This will make it much more obvious which areas of the bow are stiff and which ones are bending more. Derek Hutchinson has a similar trick which he covers in his excellent YouTube channel, Del Cat. Once again, the link to the method is in the description. Since I've never used it myself, I won't cover it here, but I think it's a very clever trick, and you may want to try it out. Last one, Stephen Gardner's No Set Tillering Method. You may know Steve from the Bowyer's Bibles, or from his many world records in flight archery. His chapters in the Bibles are some of the most insightful, and we all owe him for ridding the craft of a massive amount of BS. The general idea behind No Set Tillering is that you prioritize getting as much bend as you can out of the bow, without it taking too much set. This contrasts with how most people tiller, prioritizing the target draw length and target draw weight instead. I find a lot of use in the no set approach because personally I'd rather have a very nicely tillered 40 pound bow rather than a 50 pounder that's a little overwhelmed and has taken set. Steve's detailed explainer is linked in the description. To oversimplify, the general idea is that you want to look for signs of emerging set. And if you see more than you're comfortable with, you should drop the target draw weight. The clever bit of the method is Steve's trick for detecting set. Let me walk you through it. Every time you remove some wood and go back to the tiller tree, before you exercise the bow, pull it with the force of your target draw weight and note how far it draws. Let's say we're pulling 50 pounds at 24 inches, as an example. Okay, so we've pulled the bow and measured the draw specs. Now we can start exercising the bow by pulling it 10 to 20 times or until the wood removal adjustments have registered and settled in. Now pull the bow as far back as we did before, or 24 inches in the example. If the bow still pulls 50 pounds, it hasn't taken any set. But if you see any less than 50 pounds, that's a sign that set has developed. How much set you're okay with is a personal preference. If you're trying to set a world record in flight archery, you want as close to zero as you can manage. For most archers and hunters, losing a pound or two is not a big deal. How picky you want to be about set is all up to you. Just don't ignore it. Set is the wood trying to tell you that it's overstressed. Chapter 9, The Ten Commandments of Tillering, by Aaron G. Webster. The full text is linked below. Number 1. Never pull beyond your desired draw weight. Number 2. Remove wood only from areas that aren't bending enough. Number 3. Measure everything often. Number 4. Design for success. Number 5. Fix problems before pulling any further. Number six, don't brace until you reach 75% of your draw length. Number seven, use the shortest long string possible. Number eight, monitor emerging set. Number nine, draw the bow at least 20 times after each time you remove wood. Number 10, go slow. Chapter 10. I hope this video helped you understand the background concepts and the hows and whys of tillering that aren't often mentioned. For step-by-step -step examples with a single bow, check out the tillering chapters of my board bow tutorial, which go into a lot of step-by-step -step detail. As always, please help keep the craft alive and healthy by passing it on, subscribing to this channel, and to any other bow-making channels you come across. You can also support the craft by picking up the Bowyer's Bible series of books, or a subscription to Primitive Archer magazine. As always, find me in the comments if you have any bow-making questions at all or you caught a mistake, or have a correction. And feel free to post as many questions and tiller checks as you need. Okay, that's all for today. I'll see you in the next one. And until then, may your arrows fly true.